Good morning again, and um, thank you all for being here. You all are here for the network learning session, Birth Equity Beyond the Doctor's Office. Um, my name is Michaela Vendiola, and I serve as the Tribal Liaison for North Sound ACH. And I'll let my um, colleague Colette introduce herself as well. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, I'm Colette Harris, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Clinical Innovation Program Manager here at North Sound ACH. Thank you so much for joining us today. Back to you, Michaela. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, at each of our gatherings and events, we like to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, and our land acknowledgement at North Sound ACH was crafted in partnership with um, one of the previous tribal liaisons and our um, tribal Alignment Committee here at the ACH um, and with voice from community members. Um, so ours is, um, we begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people since time immemorial. And these are our group um, agreements. Um, so what we have here today is spread kindness, learn to disagree without breaking, allow for being uncomfortable as part of growth, be curious and ask questions, create opportunities for follow-up, share from our own experiences, use language that is respectful, accessible, and inclusive, respect the privacy and confidentiality of what is shared. Um, and I think some, some things that we have talked about in relation to our group agreement is that uh, we don't know what others are carrying. So to take care of yourself and carry that to your teams and um, to your families. Bridging is critical to creating spaces where people feel they belong so while we may not always agree, we can find ways to not other or to not break. Um, we strive for spaces that support being brave, where we can learn from and grow with one another. And uh, we want to ask questions from a place of true curiosity so that we are open to those of, oh, I hadn't thought of that in that way before moments. Um, and recognize that while we try, we will not resolve everything in real time, but we will keep track of items that need follow up. Um, to speak from what you have experienced, speak from I statements and not they statements as much as possible. Um, the words we use matter and they elicit metaphors and narratives that either show up, show up space for belonging or create exclusion. And, and then um, what is shared here is not yours to share elsewhere without permission. So just remembering that. And then finally, to encourage self-care and to please step away if and when needed. We wanted to highlight some Zoom options for you. And if you find yourself needing assistance, please look out for the tool emoji in um, participants to easily connect with Natalie, who is our um, our tech person today. Um, let's see, so yeah, Natalie has a hammer and wrench next to her her name, their name. Um, so a few house housekeeping items. Please use the chat throughout the throughout the day. It is being monitored for your questions and comments. Have your camera on if you're able to. We'd love to see your face. Um, and this meeting is being recorded. Um, just so folks know. And with that, next slide, please. I think I'll be passing it over to um, Memory Gladstone for her introduction. And um, yep, the network is a, is a learning advocacy and collaborative action network open to all community members and organizations. Today, we'll start with a grounding from Memory Gladstone followed by a panel discussion. After the panel, we'll move into small breakout groups and we'll wrap up the session with a group reflection and closing. 
and right now I'll pass it to memory. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oki Nixu Kuax, Nithani Ku, Anata Aki, Nitsitafi, I'm Scotty Pagani. Good morning. My name is Memory Gladstone. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm first generation off of the reservation. I'm an enrolled member of the Blackfeet tribe. I have served the indigenous yeah, community you. of King County for over a decade. And sí, sí, I, le estoy escuchando. I have been an active member of the um, indigenous community for the past uh -huh. 35 years. Professionally, I am a certified doula, a certified early childhood development educator, a certified lactation counselor uh, with an associate in medical billing and coding. I'm also an endorsed I'm also endorsed by the Washington Association of Infant Mental Health. So I'm an infant mental health specialist. Um, I also participate in many groups within the Pacific Northwest as well. And I am very happy to be here with all of you this morning. So today you. you all are gonna join me for one of my favorite grounding exercises. Um, so we're gonna go into a seven minute breathing exercise um, and then move on to some data from 2019 to 2021 and then we'll move on to the panel. So what, if you can move to the next slide. Oh, the next slide after that. Thank you so much. So we're gonna do the plus two breathe. In this practice, uh, the plus two breathing, you breathe out a little longer than we breathe in. And the reason for this is when you breathe in, our heart and chest expand and we get energized to focus. When we breathe out, our heart slows down and our body calms down. So if we take a long breath in and then make, an, make our exhale a little longer than our inhale, then we can gain energy and focus and then slow down our heart rate, calm down, and become more focused. So next slide, please. So some recommendations is if you can sit in a way that allows you to open up your shoulders and chest, which makes it easier to breathe in deeply. You can soften your gaze as well or close your eyes, whichever feels more comfortable to you. Next slide, please. So this, we're gonna go to the exercise. Uh, you want to notice your breath and focus on the inhalation. So continue to focus on the inhalation. So I want to see if you can notice the breathe, your, your breath expanding your chest, your abdomen, as well as the sides of your breath, your ribs and your back for the next two or three breath cycles. So I want you to breathe in naturally. And then when you breathe out, Breathe out a little bit longer, so maybe like one second longer. And I would like you to do this on your own for two breath cycles. So notice the breath in and where your body expands. Now next, After those two breath cycles, I would like you to count how many seconds you breathe in for and do this two times. Now, when you exhale, I would like you to add two seconds to your breath out. This means when you breathe out, make that a little longer than your breath in. For example, if I breathe in for three seconds, then I would want to breathe out for five seconds. And try that a few times on your own, at your own pace. And if this pace doesn't feel comfortable, I invite you to experiment with a different count. For example, if you feel like you're gasping for the next breath after you exhale, then shorten your exhalation to only one extra count or just a brief pause. I don't want, this isn't meant to make you stress or struggle or anything. So breathe in for three seconds and breathe out for four seconds. 
if it's comfortable. See what counts work for you in this very moment. The quality of the breath changes day to day and moment to moment. So give yourself what you need right now without any judgment at all. Just breathe in. Your mind may wander to other things. And remember, this is a net. This is the nature of our mind. If it does, just notice this and gently bring it back to breathing and counting. Take two more breath cycles at your own pace. And after you're, you finish your last cycle, allow yourself to breathe more freely without counting. Allow yourself a moment of appreciation. Allow yourself a moment of forgiveness this time to breathe. Okay, next slide, please. I want to thank you all for participating in this brief grounding. This is an exercise that I like to take with me everywhere I go um, in every situation. It just really helps to ground me and relieve stress and, and adding the forgiveness, you know, gives you that extra boost. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much. This panel, I also want to inform that this panel may be triggering to some people. So please take care of yourself, hydrate and nourish yourself. And if you need to step away for a moment, please do so without judgment. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to move into some data from 2019 to 2021. The Seattle Times art article cited that the data so the Seattle Times article cited data that 70% of deaths before a child's first birthday took place in South King County, the region with the highest percentage of low-income families and Black and Indigenous and people of color population. Of these infant deaths, about 70% happened during the first four weeks of life, according to the health department. Birth defects, particularly congenital heart defects, are the leading cause, followed by maternal complications during birth, while King County's overall infant mortality rate of 4.1 deaths per 1,000 births between 2019 and 2021 is below the national average of 5.4%, according to the CDC data. Black and Native babies are dying at a higher rate. Data shows that babies born to Black and American Indian and Alaska Native parents are two to three times more likely to die than babies born to white parents. The disparity in infant deaths among these populations is an indicator not only for the gap in the health care system, but the socioeconomic factors and lack of access to essential to essentials that also have an impact on the community's welfare. Next slide, please. According to data collected as part of the maternal review panel report, the risk of perinatal deaths is greater for some populations in Washington. The rate of all pregnancy associated deaths for non-Hispanic Black people and non-Hispanic Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander people was more than 2.5 times the rate of death among non-Hispanic white people. The rate of pregnancy-associated death among non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native people was 8.5 times greater than the rate of death among non-Hispanic white people. So just let that simmer in. It's really concerning. When determining contributing factors in these deaths, the panel identified discrimination, bias, interpersonal racism, or structural racism in 49% of preventable, of preventable pregnancy-related deaths from 2017 to 2020. Structural racism can impact health care quality and increase risk factors for pregnancy-related medical complications mental health conditions, trauma, 
chronic stress and chronic disease. Next slide, please. According to the March of Dimes 2020, 20, sorry, 2021 report card, poor birth outcomes from non-white birthing people, particularly Black, African American, and American Indian Alaskan Natives, have continued to worsen since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic. The Washington State Department of Mental Health Maternal Mortality Review Panels, Maternal Deaths from 2017 to 2020, the data revealed that 80% of pregnancy-related deaths were preventable with culturally congruent care. Maternal mortality rates were highest for people 35 years or older. American Indian Alaska Native individuals had statistically higher maternal mortality rates than any other ethnic group. Individuals with private health insurance during pregnancy or up to one year after had statistically lower maternal mortality rates than individuals covered through Medicaid. Very disturbing, very disturbing. So next slide, please. So with that data, I would like you all, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and we will move into our panel questions. Thank you so much, Memory, uh, for providing that physical grounding for us, as well as grounding us in the current conditions of these very racialized and colonial, colonially rooted inequities. Uh, very hard data, but very necessary to um, to discuss and to to challenge. So, um, joining Memory on the panel uh, will be. Chanel Brown from Shades of Divinity, as well as Olympia Edwards from Project Girl Mentoring Program. Um, and because we heard a little from, from memory um, already, this um, initial question um, is going to be for Chanel and for Olympia. So um, I'd like to invite you two to introduce yourselves, as well as talk a little about what inspired you to found your organizations and how your professional and personal experiences influence your decision to found your organization, as well as inform the frameworks for your organization. So if you could go ahead and just introduce yourselves and discuss. Thank you. Olympia, do you want to go first? Okay, <laughs> I'll go. All right, so my name is Chanel Brown. Um, I go by she, her. Um, I am a, well, Tacoma native. I was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington, and I currently live in Puyallup, so the Pacific Northwest is my home. And uh, my background is in public health. So I am a public health nurse. Um, I specialize in maternal child health. I've always been a public health nurse. I've never worked in the hospital. Um, this year will mark four years actually as a nurse, which is crazy to me. Seems like time just flies. But um, I spent all my time just working in maternal child health. And I started off as a nurse home visitor with Nurse Family Partnership. And I was also in this program called Black Infant Health. Um, so I had a dual role and that role was really interesting and unique because I specifically had an all black client caseload. And so I got to see firsthand the disparities that black birthing folks face. And it also humbled me because due to identifying as a Black woman myself, I was still privileged in areas such as when it came to access to health care and um, financially, I came social economically, I came from a middle class background. So um, there wasn't a, little, a lot of things that I had to think twice about. And so when I would visit my clients and I would see them from pregnancy to about two years old, when their child was two years old, I really was shocked and frustrated and angered by the lack of resources, especially here in Pierce County. I've noticed as I've done my work, King County has more resources. They're more equity focused and social justice minded. And I feel like Pierce County is more conservative and just, just there's a lack. 
And so I was, again, like I said, frustrated about it and I wanted to do more. And I was like, okay, well, first I was kind of asking around with my coworkers, my team. I was like, okay, we can do this. We can do that. We can do that. And it seemed like there wasn't much drive or initiative to really do more and take it to the next level and really impact not only our clients, but the community as a whole, the birthing community as a whole. And so um, I decided that, okay, if I'm going to keep getting pretty much tuned out and put in a corner and kind of like silence, the more I speak up and the more some of my coworkers speak up about issues, I'm just going to take the leap and advance in my career. And so uh, I moved up to working at DOH. I started off as being in the perinatal unit as a nurse consultant, I also went to get my master's. And during this time, I felt like I still wanted to do more. And that is to be in the community, wanted to do groundwork in the community. So I started or founded Shades of Divinity in December, 2023. And it was, again, due to me wanting to be in the community. It's like, okay, I feel like there aren't a lot of resources here in Washington State. I wanna help provide that. And so um, this also was motivated by what I learned through my career and through my education about how we just seen the data that uh, BIPOC birthing folk are more disproportionately impacted. Uh, we are in a maternal health crisis and two out of three of these deaths are preventable, which really infuriates me because it's not just, you know, things out of our control. We are able to prevent these things. It's a, due to a lot of communication issues. And then when you look at the qualitative data, you hear uh, Black and Indigenous birthing folks' stories. You hear them say that they're often misheard or they were ignored. And it's just, for me, when I think of when I go to like the nursing aspect, it's just ridiculous because it's just simple things that aren't being addressed that are causing these mortality rates. And I did work with the maternal mortality panel that you just heard about, and these rates are continuing to go up. COVID did not help. And it's a big issue. And so that's why I created Shades of Divinity to lower the social determinant of health risk factors that BIPOC birthing folk are facing. We do prioritize Black and Indigenous birthing folks and their families with our nonprofit. Uh, but we provide social services such as a community pantry that's free of charge. So right now you can't see, but behind me, I have like diapers, I have wipes, I have some toys, I have a bunch of books. <laughs> Uh, to give out to the community for free scholarships. We provide scholarships for BIPOC birthing folks pursue, no, sorry, BIPOC folks in general pursuing healthcare careers to increase the amount of diversity in the healthcare workforce because studies show that you are treated better by those that look like you. And then also increasing that access to education and then also um, improving or reducing financial barriers such as doing community events. And we plan to create and have a BIPOC birthing space just to improve community empowerment and also doing programs such as currently we're doing a birth kit, we call them divinity kit giveaways where we are selecting families to provide free birth kits as well as education by a midwife and a midwifery student and a place where they can connect through our private um, Facebook group. And so we provide all these and more, we plan to do more to reduce, again, those social determinant of health risk factors and also combat the systemic racism that we are facing in healthcare. I remember as a nursing student, it wasn't really talked about the reason why. Why do certain groups have higher rates for this, this, and that? And I always want to know why, but no one knew or no one wanted to say it until now. So systemic racism is a thing and it permeates our healthcare. So that is my first spiel. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Olympia. So yes, um, so my name is Olympia and I'm the CEO of Project Girl Mentoring Program. And I founded Project Girl because I wanted a space where young women of color could live in their purpose and really find spaces where they could thrive and they can really see people who look like them um, and just find that sisterhood that we all are connecting. I am a Florida native. And when I first came to Snohomish County, I was like, where's everybody at? What is actually happening? Um, 
where where are the, the people who look like me and what are they doing and involved? And so that has always been my driving force to really kind of be out there and let teens um, see see me in the community, see me doing stuff, see me have joy. And they can really kind of see like, this is what mentoring is. This is what empowerment is. And this is what people who look like me can really go out there and do amazing things. In our programs, we do mentoring, we do after school programs, we do free summer camps, and we also do teen and family counseling. As we know, like Chantel highlighted, that, you know, COVID didn't push every, COVID pushed everything out in the forefront. And with the teens that I, we work with, there's a lot of isolation that is still going on. There's a lot of fear that's still going on. There's still like food insecurities. And all the things that's happening in the community as adults have been experiencing, our teens are experiencing on a different level. And that is why Project Girl really do exist, um, to be that avenue where teens feel like they have somewhere to connect connect with. They have someone that they can kind of see. And that was one of the biggest things that I observed throughout just growing up in this area. I'm not growing up in this, but just coming to this area and really just kind of see like, how can I really be that person that connect and make the community happen for young women. Um, so yeah. Thank you. I'm just feeling so inspired by the the power in this this virtual space right now. Um, so the next question is for, for everyone, all three panelists, uh, because we are a collaborative action network, I wanna talk a little about partnerships. So could you share examples about um, successful community partnerships and their outcomes and what that looked like for you and your organizations and anybody who wants to go, just go for it. I can go. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I work with Open Arms Perinatal Services and uh, we've been around for over 25 years. Um, and we have a variety of different partners and um, organizations that we connect with on a regular basis. basis. And so examples of partnerships for our organization, uh, we have a variety. So we um, have partners that they donate essential items for our baby boutique or items for resource fairs that we host. We have financial spark, part, uh, sponsorships. Um, and we also partner with folks that come in to do tabling at our community events as well. Uh, we're very fortunate to partner with incredible community organizations and individuals to support community access to resources um, like essential items and education opportunities. A few of our partners is uh, PEPS, the Seattle Public Library, Tilt Alliance, uh, Westside Baby, and Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, the Puget Sound, like Chanel had said, the Puget Sound region is really fortunate to have an incredible ecosystem of community organizations and individuals to support communal access to resources, um, to access to essential items and educational opportunities for families. Um, the following community partners are at the heart of this collective work and together increase support for resources, referrals, and share a commitment to equity, access, and justice. So a, a few of our community-based perinatal service providers um, is BlackBerry, Centers for Indigenous Midwifery, Global Perinatal Services, Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services, the, P the Pacific Islander Health Board, Quilted Health, WellPoint, Best Starts for Kids, Molina Healthcare, Public Health, Seattle and King County, uh, Seattle Human Services, um, and Washington State Department of Children and Youth and Families. Um, for me, I um, I look at organic partnerships, like those where it's not like a lot of like hard, we had to labor to do a lot to do um, to connect. But with working with teens, it may look like experiences or activities and how I make partnership. Like um, last year, we were, able, we were able to partner with Bastyr and take a tour of their uh, their college, which is a specialty college, where we were able to kind of see like what is happening for people who are doing advanced degrees. We were able to kind of like look at different um, different colleges, different, um, sorry, different I guess, degree areas in the area. And then we actually had a chance to look at the midwifery area and um, the kids were able to kind of connect and actually see like a, a black 
or a brown um, doula who's actually kind of, I can't remember, I can think of the name, but a brown doula who's actually showing them how they are born. And that is where like our partnerships are really kind of organic. It was like a relationship with one of the um, counselors out there that's been over the years, but just been nurturing. And as you see, like you see teens who are kind of seeing like, what does a baby look for the first time? How does a person who is, who birthed, what does it look like? And all of the things that, that happens, um, which is 11, 12 and 13 year olds, sometimes that could be scary. You think about everything, but you also know their bodies is changing. Um, so like those are the type of partnerships that I kind of really look for where I have ex different experiences or different activities and the mentors who want to be involved in that process as well to kind of show the teens that we work with how different areas and different different ways of what our teens can kind of be um, exposed to. So exposure is a big thing um, within the work that I do. Yeah, um, I have multiple, well, we have multiple community partners here at Shades of Divinity and we are still currently trying to connect and network with more due to us being so young, you know, just being a little over a year old. And I think within our first year, we have been pretty successful with establishing partnerships. Um, we have partnered with CBOs and community members such as PLU's Delta Little Chai, which are the PLU nursing students. Um, I connected with them actually through my work as a nurse home visitor. And so them and Shades of Divinity was able to collaborate with them to uh, provide turkeys to the community. So yearly uh, they give out turkeys to folks and then we were able to take some of the turkeys and uh, give them out at People Center at the hilltop are in Tacoma. And so we also were able to, again, work with Delta Lola to provide a toy drive at, at a People's Center's holiday event. We've also established partnerships with Blackberry. Blackberry is actually our sister site. And so I know Jasmine Williams very well, and I work closely with her. We've also, well, I am a part of the Black Mamas Collective, and so that is ran or organized by Rokia Jones. They're the ones that host Seattle's Black Maternal Health Week events, which is coming up soon in a few weeks. So um, if anyone wants to attend that, you can go to the Black Mamas socials and register. And yeah, we have um, those partnerships. We also have... Um, trying to establish partnerships with the local LHJ, so the local health departments as well. And it's pretty tricky being the executive director while also working at a state government position because I'm trying not to cross the line and um, create any conflict of interest. But those are just a few partnerships that we have done. And then also, of course, with my DOH job, I have worked on community engagement, which is working with local CBOs for the birth equity project. And so I was able to learn more about uh, Washington's uh, community through that aspect as well. Thank you so much, everyone. And just seeing the photos from the, the partnership with uh, Project Girl and Best Year, um, I saw them, you know, I think last year, and I just have not forgotten the images, seeing the black pelvic models and seeing the, the girls learning from midwifery students who look like them and kind of gaining that exposure to birth work as a profession, but also Olympia, I remember you said kind of learning about like bodily autonomy and um, learning how to advocate for themselves. So I just, yeah, the images are Brain. So thank thank you all uh, for talking about partnerships. And uh, we talked a little about it already, and it's in our title. We wanted this to be thinking about birth equity kind of beyond the, the doctor's office or beyond the provider's office. So what are birth equity or practices that promote birth equity that are community-based? Um, and what does it look like when we implement them on a community level? I can go. <laughs> um, so, and I guess this is, I have a hard time saying this because these are like basic things, you know, that really 
people should be receiving in general. And it shouldn't be something that's like equity are, you know, under those categories, but just really clear communication of information of all of the birthing person's options that are available to them. Um, clinicians and care teams honoring the birthing person's birth plan. And that generally includes culturally, their cultural practices and their cultural traditions. Um, and a lot of the doulas that I support are really advocating for the family's rights and their birthing traditions and their birthing plans to be honored. Um, and that it, it, and so to me, I'm like, these are just basic, you know, like this is like our basic rights, but these are not things that are being honored. Um, and for, for me, I'm like, Hey, make this a celebration, you know, like make this birth a celebration, uh, make it a family tradition to support our new, our new birthing parents and, you know, bringing it back to similar how we did pre-colonialism. And so what does this look like? This is, and this is what a lot of our community-based doulas do for the families that we support. It's honoring birthing rituals for families honoring homecoming rituals for families, talking with a birthing person on discharge instructions and things to look for that may require urgent attention, because that's where we're seeing a lot of the um, mortalities are happening is these early few weeks of the warning signs to look for and and maybe they um maybe they did voice it and they weren't listened to you know so just those those things uh one of the things that we like to do is a meal train for the first two weeks so creating a list of people who can drop off meals for the first two weeks so the birthing person doesn't have to worry about cooking food while they're recovering for their birth um, another thing I like to do is a chore chain as well for the first two weeks. And this lists a group of folks who can come in and help out with essential chores without being asked, you know, because a lot of us have a hard time asking for help. And so if we just create something and they just come in at like, oh, hey, you're going to expect this person at this time. Oh, my gosh, that's such a relief, you know, and it's essential chores, Um for them that they don't have to worry about and they can focus on bonding with their baby and they can focus on, you know, continuing to heal. Now I know this healing process takes way more than two weeks, but that's what we like to focus on because during that time, that's a crucial healing period. Um, and so for our doulas, we come in uh, for the first two weeks, we will pop in, you know, two to three times each week for the first two weeks, because we know that's a crucial time where things go overlooked. After that time period, we come in weekly up until the child's three months old, and we help out with anything that the family needs helping, you know, with lactation, housework, you know, like anything, any questions. Um, and what we like to also do is create is is there a person close to the family or a friend to the birthing person who can stay with or pop in to check in outside of you know like our doulas that because we are only popping in once a week but we know that this care is needed consistently you know so we like what what is your support system what is your support network that you know somebody can come in and support with uh with taking care of the baby while the birthing person showers, you know, or taking care of the baby while the birthing person can get like a solid hour of like sleep without having to worry about anything um, and reminding them to, to hydrate, you know, and, and to eat. Um, and we pop in at that point once a week, but this is needed seven days a week, you know? So it's like it are creating our support system and, and, historically, we had our groups, you know, we had mothers that would come in, it's like, oh, you rest for, you know, for X amount of time, and everything is taken care of around you. We had our nutrients to help build our body back up. We had our traditional foods, our roots, our, um, our, our traditional medicines to help us heal, which we don't have now. Um, and so just creating resources as well for our, uh, our families, you know, local parenting groups, lactation groups, and early childhood development programs, because also getting them back out into a system to and into an environment where other folks might be um, in the same situation, you know, so like when we birth, it doesn't mean that everybody around us is going or understanding the situation that we're in. And so getting them connected with folks that are in the same situation, or maybe have been in the same situation where they can connect with, you know, and build that build that bond and friendship. Um, 
and continue to connect with a birthing person to check in on how parenting is going, how are they feeling and any goals, you know, that they might have for themselves too, because that kind of gets lost, you know, like we're, our bodies go through so much in the pregnancy and the birthing phase. And then we go through the recovery phase and then we're taking care of our baby, you know, and then we sometimes forget about ourselves. And so that's where we're like, Hey, you are just as important. Let's, let's take care of you. And as you start to build, you know, after the first year of that process, the second year, we usually focus on, Hey, what are your goals? Like, what do you want to do? What do you, where do you see yourself? And a lot of the times the families that we support, they want to get into the same field. They want to be a doula. They want to be a lactation counselor. They want to be out there to help support their community the same way that they had been supported because it has been such a profound impact on their life and their family dynamic. So those are just like, for me, I'm like, it, these are basic things that we had pre-colonialism and that's what we need to get back to. Yeah, I want to piggyback. I completely agree. It's for us in this work, it could, it seems simple, like common knowledge, but it obviously isn't with the data that we are seeing right now. And I, I'm going to be <laughs> switching back and forth between my public health government hat in my community hat. But I always say, and I learned this very quickly, it just involve community in all aspects. Like we do not give lived experience enough credit. If you are serving a certain group or population, make sure that they're involved. Don't make decisions for them. Don't assume things. Give them time and give them space and give them a chance to speak and share what they would like, what they would like to see for themselves or their community and just listen. And then including with, when it comes to program development, include them in every step, assessment, planning, evaluation, and just make sure the programs are community centered. I see some uh, local government and organizations in the chat, just make sure when you're creating these programs, again, make sure they're community centered, create these and have the advisory committees be uh, made up of majority if it's centered on maternal child health so like birth workers you know uh parents and not so much staff or uh higher leadership just to create that equity and then um also such as uh as far as shades of divinity um like i mentioned before one of the big plans we have is to find a space so we can create a bipoc community space so it's not just for us to house our pantry and provide our services but it's for folks such as doulas such as a parent such as a family advocates to come in and host their events if they have childbirth education uh, parent uh, support groups that they want to do doula sessions just for them to come and have a space mainly due to, again, going back to social determinants of health, that financial barrier of there's folks out here that want to do the work and want to help, but finances can get in the way because it, it costs money to find the space. And, you know, with Washington, or at least Western Washington, we only get sun so many days out the year. So it's not like all these events can just be hosted outside or somewhere else that's free. So we want to provide that space to folk, for folks for community empowerment and also to reduce barriers. And I want to emphasize that with everything you do, make sure it's low barrier. Uh, folks are already going through enough nowadays and just creating things that are low barrier just makes it easier for folks to not only obtain those resources that you're providing, but also to thrive and be successful. And as far as if you're into data collection, this is for like my healthcare folks. Uh, if you're into like data collection and research, make sure you include qualitative data. Like qualitative data doesn't get as much props as quantitative data, but there's power in stories. There's power in just listening. If you're hosting listening sessions, just being there and just listening. You don't have to provide the answers. You don't have to solve the problems right then, but just listening and just being present. And then sometimes the community just wants to know, it's like, hey, I hear you. I see you. I hear you. We're working to advocate for you. Being an advocate for them, um, like I said, we're providing perinatal 
education soon throughout the months of April, May, and June. And we're also including the cultural components. So going back to like the basics and tradition, and it's like, hey, just because you're giving birth doesn't mean that it has to be this whole procedure, like the hospitals make it out to be, where it's like you have no involvement. This is your birth. You have some control. You have a say. You can provide birth plans. You can provide your postpartum plans after and just being a part of the process. And so that is something that I always think about in my different realms of work is how to include community. What about them? How to bring the folks that we're serving into this work and even things as a Facebook group that we're creating. Okay, you may not be able to get access to these resources that we provide at this time or go and be a part of a community event that we're hosting. But hey, you could be a part of this Facebook group and it can decrease isolation, you can get your questions answered, or you can just have other folks to talk to that are in the same sim or similar instance as you. You're both pregnant, you're both um, indigenous or black, or, you know, you just share uh, common things and just having a place for just sharing or creating space for community is something that's, I think is undervalued. Um, I would add to say, I think it starts way before they even get to the point where they're about to be birthing. Um, of like how the like community based and community level is destigmatizing, like the idea of going to get help with a doctor or getting a doula, having those conversations early on. Since we work primarily with girls, um, it's having those conversations where they get to see people, see doctors, see nurses who look like them, who might not look like them, but who can they can develop that trust. Um, and getting out there and sharing their story and saying like, this is what one day, if you choose to birth a, a person in the world, this is what you can experience. This having that conversation, where we're talking about the body. I know Colette, you mentioned about the autonomy. We're talking about what do you want for your body? What do you not want for your body? How do you want a, a experience to feel that way? I think so having that conversation early on when they're teens and we're talking about their bodies and their bodies are already changing. Um, letting them know that is happening. And then on the more on the community level, what we do in our office, since we're primarily women, we bring our kids. They can kind of see like, this is what it means to like have a family and do different things. And this, we also talk about like our experiences with birth is so like kind of breaking down those barriers where they like, it might, might be a whole bunch of other stuff that we've heard and we've seen on TV, but really they can really kind of connect, um, and actually see what actually what, what it might be. And so that's a big part of the work of like the community is breaking down the barriers, desigmatizing the things that what we might perceive things to be and really making these connections um, where we might take them to different areas where they can kind of see like one day I might birth a person into this world and this is how the situation might be. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we have a little time prior to going to the breakout session. So I want to ask one more question. Um, and that is, um, are there any questions, um, for you that kind of never get asked or folks, folks don't bring up that you would like to address or anything that you would just like to share with folks on the call that like, doesn't get posed to you? Did that makes sense. Sorry. So anything you'd like to share that we didn't ask or that doesn't commonly get asked to you? I think one thing that I, um, and just to kind of piggyback on what Olympia said about having the birthing experience and the lactation experience being shared and making it a norm. One of the things that I would really love to see is having these professions being exposed to high schoolers, you know, like nobody knows about these professions unless they have somebody in the family that's in that profession. You know, like I went through a lot of lactation. So my, it's like a norm to, <laughs> to talk about lactation or birth or, you know, like I was looking at a cloud one day and I'm like, Oh, that looks like a placenta. You know, my daughter's like, that is so random. Like you, you only have those conversations in our household, you know? And it's like, these should be a norm, you know, there's other countries that implement this very early on in elementary school, you know, because it is part of our human body and dynamic. And it should be, it should be um, 
looked upon in such a beautiful way, you know, like our bodies have been sexualized for so long that we need to bring it back to be an honoring our women, honoring the birthing traditions, honoring the lactation, but also these need to be in like career fairs, you know, like these, these professions are needed and they're essential for our cultures to continue you know through the next generations to come but if our families don't know our next generations that are our next leaders if they don't know about these professions they're not going to opt for it and a lot of the times you know they get into college and then they're like oh my gosh I wish I would have known about this and they almost have to start their their college route all over again to get into this field so if they learn about these early on then they know what routes to take to uh to continue into these professions um but also you know just not to hide this like I know like I said our bodies have been sexualized and so a lot of times we're like oh my gosh cover up when you're breastfeeding you know like oh we don't want to uh include this talk or you know and in, into our families but it it's needed and it, and it's needed across all genders because our young men and our young women that are birthing and our birthing people we need to support each other in all areas and if we don't know how to support each other then that's going to create a gap in its own and so for me I'm like normalize it normalize chest feeding normalized birthing normalize and and create an honor system and how impact like empower our birthing people because this was such a great gift that we were blessed with and it has through colonialism things have changed you know and we need to bring that honoring system back and we need to make these professions aware and you know like if if maybe that profession of being a birth worker or a lactation consultant is not for them, then get into a higher level where you can make that change, make a difference, you know, into legislation. Um, because we also know that it's a trickle down effect, right? So it, we are doing a lot of work at the lower level, but it also takes the work at the higher level to make all of this, you know, move into plan. And so just letting our young folks know the impact that they can make. And I think that you know, it would also decrease a lot of mental health issues. It would decrease a lot of, um, um, a lot of suicide rates, you know, when, you, when our, our children are empowered and like this, you were born into this, this is, you know, your ancestors are supporting you in every way, shape or form. And this is why, because we need to see these changes, like empowering them with the knowledge and then showing them the path that they need to go through to make this change. Thank you. Chanel or Olympia, anything that you just like to share that we didn't ask? Uh, um, hmm. There's a lot of things I'd like to share, <laughs> but I just want to piggyback on um, what was said. I do think it's important to, again, create self-empowerment and shift the power back into the hands of the individual. Like when it comes to not knowing, I didn't know about the career path that I'm on now. I just, as a nurse, I was in nursing school. It was just like, okay, hospital, LMD, ER, med surge. Uh, I didn't know really about public health until one of my instructors, instructors, she was a nurse home visitor and she had a, a her coworkers come in and present. And so when I heard about this, I was like, oh, you can go in the homes, you can visit the families, you can do many assessments, you can watch their child as they grow, you can help them out. That's something that's not, as far as my experience, really promoted in healthcare education. And so when I took that route, it's like, I loved it. And then every time I'm part of a panel with students or public health workers, and I explain this, they're like, what is this? Like, there's just a lack of knowledge of different, I guess, untraditional aspects, because people may say like in the nursing world, it's like, oh, it's not real nursing, but just because I'm not in the hospital doesn't mean I'm not doing nursing. I'm just, I'm at a different capacity. And now I'm thinking systemically, I'm thinking about preventative health instead of just treating one patient right at the moment and sending them on their way. Like I get to walk with them. I get to see a snapshot of their lives. And that's really what 
is part of my foundation to doing the work where I'm at now at the state level and at the community level. I'm, I'm able to take my lived experience and then my experiences with these, with my clients and apply it to this work. And so that's also when it comes to education, like I my clients and ask them about, do you know about doula? Do you know about birth plan? And they had no idea. And it's like, okay, well, if they're not if I wasn't here, where would they get this education from? And so I think it's just like a, a lack of knowledge in all areas that I agree that needs to be promoted more. And I think that's a part of the shift to more adequate health care and birth equity. Thank you. Um, one thing that I would like to share is that how we're all connected and how we all need each other to do the work that we're all doing. Like the birth work people need, the people who work with the homeless prevention, who is security, we need the people who work with youth, we need the people who work with um, re-entering our people who are involved in prison work. All of us is really connected so much and that we have to remember that and that we have to continue to work together to work on some of the issues that we have as society. Um, even when it comes to like just funding, like we're all connected. Like when it comes to partnering, we're all connected. And so like, I guess that's one thing is like always invite each other to the table because you never know what someone else is kind of working on and how we can really partner or might do something that one of us might can like spark an idea with something else that we are somebody else is struggling with in another sector. So yeah. Thank you. I think that's a really great reminder. And I think also a really great um, transition to our, our breakout sessions. Um, so we are going to go um, uh, into to breakout sessions for discussion um, to continue this like amazing discussion that's happening. And the, the two questions that I would like folks to consider in the, the breakout sessions is considering the importance of building relationships highlighted by our panelists. How do you see your organization working to collaborate strategically with other organizations to promote birth equity within your field? And also, did any of the community-based practices shared by the panelists resonate with you? If so, which practice do you feel you could support within your community? And we'll go to breakout sessions for about 20 minutes, then come back kind of for a share back and discussion of what we talked about. And then we will um, invite folks to ask questions of our panelists. I see that there are already questions in the chat and we'll get to those after, after we come back from the breakout sessions. So if we could go to the breakout sessions now. Hope the discussions were fruitful and that connections were able to happen. Um, I would like to get right into the questions that uh, appeared in the chat prior to going to the breakout session. Uh, so the first question, um, Chanel, the data you presented on childbirth, deaths, and maternal mortality was very devastating among minority demographics, BIPOC. Do we know what is being done by the government to address it? Um, that's kind of a tough question to answer. Uh, I I personally think there could be way more that's being done, but they do have a uh, certain initiatives uh, federally that are going on, but I know more locally, so state government. I did mention in the chat that, so the previous unit I worked for, the perinatal unit, they have what's called the Birth Equity Project. And uh, it was basically providing funding to local uh, BIPOC or underserved communities in Washington state to help support their initiatives and their programs, which have been successful so far. And I will say that it's a great approach to birth equity because um, we had the help from a community advisory board that was made up of all birth workers. And so they were able to guide that and make that more community centered. And they also were the ones that did the scoring. So we were really just the middleman. And uh, we were able to get a more equitable outcome compared to the first cohort, which was uh, very interesting, but there have been great improvements that have been made. And so that is what is being done from the 
a local state standpoint. Um, I wish I can give you more about federally, but there is a lot of initiatives and work to bring maternal health and the maternal health crisis to the forefront, especially from a lot of CBOs, like on the East Coast, like in the South, like Black Mamas Matter, um, or here we have doulas for all. And I want to say, um, to answer the question in the chat about Medicaid, I want to say, and I needed to verify this, but I did see something on LinkedIn about it getting approved um, the for doulas to get covered by Medicaid. And so again, I can't confirm that, but I hope that what I saw was true, which is a huge step. And that's something that's being, that was being championed by doulas for all, which is a doula group here in Washington, because it's very important because we talk about doulas, but we also have to realize that access to a doula itself is a barrier because they're not covered by Medicaid. And so the out-of-pocket cost is expensive. And so a lot of folks who want to do a can't afford them. And so that's why um, actually Shades of Divinity, we're working on trying to get funding so we can cover the costs for doula services uh, for folks, um, starting off with a few families and just trying to expand because again, we want to reduce those barriers. So I'm hoping my answer was helpful. I wish I could give you more details, but um, that's what I have. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. That was my question. Actually, it coincided that I just received an email about prenatal and maternal health funding that is available for, available, for, available for people to apply. I think this kind of connects with that. So hopefully if I review the material, it might be able to give us some data about what we can, what they're trying to do to, to address this issue. But thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, Memory and Olympia, do you have anything to contribute to that question? If not, I'll go on to the next question. Um, for the, I'm sorry, what question was that? Oh, I'm sorry. Either like what the government is doing um, or about the yep. doula and Medicaid coverage. So uh, Open Arms, we hire a lobbyist um, to fight for the, we uh, partner with doulas for all and to fight for the um, passing of the doula reimbursement. And it has been passed. Um and the cost is like the a cost awarded is $3,500, which is the highest in the nation. Um, but there are some barriers with that. And so this really impacts individual providers that have their own uh, businesses because there is a certification process that has to happen. They did put some funds into the budget to have a kind of like an organization as a hub to provide um there's an application process that they have to get um, connected with all of the Medicaid uh, uh, providers like Molina and um, all of the healthcare providers. So they have to have like a contract built in with those individual providers. So it has been passed, but there still is a lot of work that has to happen for the larger organizations. Um, like there's going to have to be uh, a biller for individual Medicaid because there is um, just specific guidelines around billing directly for Medicaid. Um, it, and for my organization that's been around for over 25 years, we are putting a plan in and it may not happen for 2024, but we're shooting for like 2025. Um, and so there is, we have made segue, but there, there's still a long road ahead of us, um, in that aspect, but it's great that we are able to have the reimbursement, but to be able to, um, allow though, we found that it's really going to impact those that are, uh, individual contractors because they're good. They're the ones that are going to have to pay a lot out of pocket. Sorry. I have my toddler sitting next to me. Um, there's, they're the ones that are going to have to go through the extensive work and out-of-pocket costs to be able to even receive those reimbursements. Um, and so those th that's what we've seen so far. Um, and that's a huge step uh, that has been uh, worked on for several years now by Doulas for All and other collaborative organizations. Um, and so we'll see uh, if we can you know, push for other support systems. Great, thank you. Um, the next question that we got in the chat was, I'm curious, do any of the panelists know of support services for folks who are unable to give birth for various reasons? Would love to learn more about the different types of supports. Uh, 
Um, so because we primarily work with uh, pregnant folks, we don't have a whole lot of resources, but I guess, you know, it's also individually based um, depending on a person's circumstance. But through traditional medicine, we have found that uh, uh, perineum steaming is really beneficial for healing our uterus uh, for all, you know, the chemical impacts that have happened through just um, our menstrual um our, our menstrual supplies, you know, we found all the toxins that are inside of our pads and inside of our tampons and things like that really have an impact on our bodies and our overall um, uh, birthing system. And so we found that through perineum steaming, um, there's different herbs that can help heal your womb and, 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 in turn heal your overall ph balance of your your mind and body so i uh, know some birth workers that specialize in perineum steaming where they were able to have folks that you know for various reasons weren't able to conceive were able to heal their womb and to to conceive a baby um or just you know after if this was something that is usually done by some cultures after you deliver a baby also which has been you know lost in in our traditions um but as far as like i have personal referrals and things like that but not necessarily like a wide um, network of resources in that area. And I think it would just kind of be, it's like a case by case basis because everybody's situation is different. Um, so it, it would kind of need like a consultation of like, you know, what are the reasons, what are the barriers and, you know, uh, ways of being able to support that individual. Thank you. Um, I see a question for Chanel. Uh, can you share what a birth kit is and what it contains? Yes, I was actually trying to type out the response in the chat, but I was like, okay, I'll just say it anyways. So um, I will say that a birth kit is basically like, so the inspiration came from, you know, how you can subscribe to some subscription and they'll give you a, a monthly random item or box of different stuff and so we want to do that but tailor it to perinatal items and we eventually came up with the divinity kit program which are birth kits that will contain things to help support the pregnant person and uh, their babies so uh, we are currently finalizing the list right now we have our families that we are going to get ready to start supporting them with this program but it includes things such as books to help promote education and bonding swaddles, uh, kits, uh, just items that, you know, things that you want when you're pregnant or when you're postpartum. Um, we also are providing things such as, uh, they're called uh, lactation treats to help promote like breastfeeding, chest feeding, and postpartum, and also uh, postpartum items. And so it's just different items that I will say that like, again, that's something that you would want during your pregnancy and postpartum. And I'm really proud of the program so far, uh, because we really aim to work to find items that are from BIPOC, a business owner. So the Milky Mama treats that support lactation, there that is a black owned company. Um, we actually found some indigenous blankets that we will be providing for our indigenous applicants. Um, and then also finding um products by a uh, Latin business owners. And so just really trying to incorporate all BIPOC owners that create perinatal related products into the kits because we want to promote that cultural aspect. And then in addition, again, to these kits, um, we'll be providing education that will be available to the public. So if you follow our socials or if you find us on our website, um, we will be providing three 
perinatal uh, webinar sessions for those who are expecting or who just want to listen in. And so that goes hand in hand again to promote education. And again, um, what we talked about, just promoting self-empowerment, because a lot of folks, they don't know and they want to learn and um, bringing back culture into your pregnancy journey as well. So we'll have a little segment on how you can include your traditions, your values, into uh, your birth plan or just your pregnancy overall. So we just, again, have like different items that we'll be including uh, for the applicants. It's a brand new, so we're working out the kinks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question I see in the chat, I am seeking recommendations for local advocacy groups that can provide guidance and support for BIPOC who have experienced discrimination by healthcare providers during the perinatal period in Whatcom County. Any of the panelists or anyone from the audience who, who may know. I know that there is a need in Whatcom County, um, Skagit County. Uh, that's where we're seeing a lot of gaps in support services and in care as a lot of our families are, you know, relocating due to gentrification. Um, so I know that there is a lot of gaps. Unfortunately, I don't know very many um, resources in those areas. I'm sorry, I wish I could be more of help. I know there's a need you know, so if we can just voice that uh, for funders that they need to allocate funding out to other counties is what is definitely needed. Anyone else? If not, that's potentially an area, I think, for collaboration um, for us as, as a collaborative action network. Um, this is Jackie and Julian. I'd actually dropped my um, chat. I saw that in there um, when I just shared that we're an advocacy based group. We're in Snohomish County, um, but we are a coalition. So we partner with one um, agencies across the region. One of the things we did to combat one and address this on a system level was to fight for House Bill um, 1889, which was the removal of illegal immigration status requirements for, for, for professional licensure. One, we know one of the ways as right folks have one shared on the panel is the disproportionality and the challenges in one being fair, being treated fairly with services. And so having equitable um, and favorable outcomes with folks that one look like you represent you and understand you. And so this is a huge win um, for Washington state. So um, that's one of the ways that uh, we won pot this year to address those inequities in our system. Thank you so much for sharing, Jackie, and the work that you've done. Um, I was going to say um, for Whatcom County, maybe check in with Chuckanut Health Foundation. I know they have a racial equity coalition that they're forming, um, and they're all about, um, you know, health equity. So um, maybe check Chuckanut Health Foundation. Thank you for the recommendation. I see a hand raised from Natasha Frey. Hi, yes, um, I'm Natasha. I'm with Children of the Setting Sun. Um, our breakout session was just three of us and um, Yawen from Mount Baker Planned Parenthood was the sole um, representative for a direct care provider. And I just recommended that there be a tribal liaison and um, particularly for Planned Parenthood interfacing with indigenous communities. I think there's some um, foundational work, probably also healing work around presenting the resources that Planned Parenthood offers in a way that is not perceived as a threat in in terms of just understanding the the history of government and um just that it's it's not an organization that's trying to decrease population but that is actually trying to elevate health and 
just gave some suggestions about what that, you know, might look like to try to connect with the culture departments at Lummi and Nooksack in Whatcom County and try to build build that relationship a little bit more. Thank you for that. I think that's a great recommendation given what we know about like forced sterilization and medical experimentation. So thank you for that, that recommendation. I see another question. Looks like there is a funding announcement on prenatal and maternal health proposal. It will be good to have potential partners to collaborate with on this project. Does North Sound have information on such partners? I'm happy to jump in and yeah, that would be great. And answer this. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I was looking um, at you. <laughs> so uh, we certainly have a list of organizations and partners within the Collaborative Action Network. And we're pretty excited in the last couple of months, we added two people uh, to kind of be on the lookout for fun development ideas. So if there's something specific, it'd be awesome if you sent it our way and uh, we could see if we can you know, get that out to partners that might be interested. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one uh, you're referring to, but it'd be awesome because I, I do think our staff is trying to figure out how we can make some of those connections so that there can be some collaborative proposals. And, you know, if there's a partner out there that wants to take the lead, we want to help however we can in helping you put those proposals together. So, I'm thinking like you could send that to our teams at North Sound ACH email address and we can have somebody get back to you. Yeah, that, that was my question, but that, thank you. But we will do that. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Are there any more questions folks can either put in the chat or if you want to raise your hand? To, to pose a question to our panelists or to just kind of share back what was discussed in the breakout session? Not a quick one, figured I would throw it out there, but do any of the panelists have like any quick tips on um, self-advocacy? Because I feel like that's, um, say, um, specifically as someone who is a birthing person, they're going to their doctor, they're following the process, but they're not being heard, they're not being listened to. Do y'all have any tips on like, well, this is how I can self-advocate? Great question. Panelists? So I, I, I highly recommend doula services um, if that's available in the area. Um, like I said, we, we provide free doula services um, through a few different counties uh, because usually we find that when a doula is present, then folks are more... Um, more heard and uh and their like birth plans and things like that are honored uh, but there are grievance policies in each entity as well and so if that person is not wanting to listen to you like if this is your provider that's going to be delivering you also have the right to choose and change providers at any point in time uh, because this person is working for you and providing you support and services um, so if this if you're not being heard by your provider like this is one of the biggest concerns among our BIPOC community is that the providers are not listening then please switch to a different provider to somebody that will listen to you and that will honor your traditions um because if they're not listening now at a really early stage in like your pregnancy or whatever point, then, you know, it's going to become a bigger problem when you go to deliver as well. Um, and so my thing is that you have the right to change providers at any point in time. You have a right to change facilities at any point in time. Um, and if there is, if it goes as far as to a grievance, every entity has a grievance policy and follow that route. Um, we've gone as far as, you know, having a meeting with the, and this is just for my own family. Like, uh, before I even got into birth work, uh, we had to go as far as having a meeting with the, um, the delivery manager of the entire floor because of things that had happened during my sister's, uh, uh, delivery process. And, 
So there's, there's ways that you can navigate that. Hopefully it does not get to that level, but um, just knowing the in, just reading the grievance policies, um, knowing what your rights are as, uh, as a patient, that even if you're in the middle of delivery, you have the right to ask for a different staff, you know, a different nurse. If this nurse mm-hmm. is not listening to you, if this provider is not listening to you, you have the right to to ask for for somebody else's support. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing a raised hand from Pa Ojuf. This will be the the last question before close. So if you want to go ahead and ask the panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question would be mostly for memory. Um, thanks for the deliberation that you've said just rec- right now in terms of um, the choices that they have. And by the way, I am Paus Manju, the executive director of the Washington West African Center. Um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants, those with language barriers, those that are scared, to talk and advocate for themselves. It would not be as easy as um, probably you mentioned uh, for the choices that you said to change um, careers and providers because folks struggle right now. Our agency is dealing with an influx of immigrants that came to the United States, pregnant women, nursing moms who struggle so hard to even be seen for the first time who don't have insurance and don't have access to these things. So the slightest opportunity they have to be seen by one of the local community health centers, they take advantage of that. And the conditions are so bad for them, but that is the only choice that they have to be here. Some of them are faced with a lot of um, language barriers and other issues. There is no more time to de- um, deliberate on these things, but our situations are deeper and more complex than the ordinary um, situation or the average privileged person faces and may not be as easy as um, you're saying, because this could be the only opportunity that folks have after maybe several weeks or months of struggling. You see somebody being pregnant for several months, having two months to the delivery before they can actually have access to a provider for the first time, the chance or tendency for that person to want to change that provider would be very slim. I would just leave it at that, but maybe folks understand where I'm coming from and the deep nature of the challenges and complexities that my community faces. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I totally understand about the language barriers and how it could be challenging to navigate the systems. Uh, for your community. We also partner with a organization called Global Perinatal Services. And uh, this was actually founded by a the first Somali uh, midwife in Washington state. And so uh, Faisa, she actually um, just opened up her own birthing center. It is located in Federal Way, um, but they are supporting um, uh, the African-American and Somali communities. And they are now able to um, also, Fiesa would travel to other midwife clinics to deliver and also hospitals, depending on where their clients were delivering at. Um, and she has been a partner with Open Arms for, um, for decades now. And uh, that is her passion is because seeing all of these barriers, um, unnecessary interventions happening to uh, her community. So she was able to create her own doula program and now midwife clinic to be able to deliver. So I can share the information. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure where you're located, but this is a really, um, this is a really great we are in our offices in Linwood, but we are a statewide agency, so we'll appreciate okay. the contact. Yes, absolutely. And I put I my share, email. Yeah, I'll sh- I share uh, the link to their program in the in the chat. Great, thank you so much for that question, and thank you, Memory, for addressing it. Um, 
I just cannot thank our panelists enough um, for just the the breadth and the depth of your knowledge and your experience and your compassion um, and being here with us in this space today. Um, so we thank you so much. Thank you uh, for our participants, um, for participating in the discussion and just the great questions um, and really hope that this can be the beginning of further discussion and, and action. Uh, just a reminder that you can explore more on our, our resource library. Um, we'll put the links to the recording, the slides, all of the related resources that were discussed um, in today's session on the resource library within the next few days. Also a reminder to complete the survey about uh, today's session just to kind of help inform future sessions um, and that we can continue to grow and evolve. And I think um, there is information. What is the date for our next learning session? It will be in May, I believe. May 15th, and it will be on health and the outdoors, which is very exciting. I look forward to that. Um, so just again, thank you so much to our panelists and to our participants, and hope you, you have a great rest of your day.